Welcome to the Marine Corps Reserve Association podcast, where we provide information to increase your personal and professional development and provide historical perspective of significant events within our core history. Now, without further delay, let's listen to the latest installment of the NCRA podcast. Welcome, everyone, to this week's edition of the Marine Corps Reserve Association podcast. Uh, we are indeed honored and privileged to have the newest Marine uh, unit uh, on with us, the Marine Innovation Unit. We have the commanding officer, Colonel Matt Swindell, and we're privileged to have the Sergeant Major Robert uh, Lusk. Uh, Matt and Sergeant Major, hey, I, I can't tell you how excited the association is to have you guys uh, with us today. Before we get started, I, I, I have to do a little intro here. Um, Colonel Swindell is one of the few that I know that actually began his Marine Corps career in uh, 1993 as an enlisted man graduating from Paris Island. And he was commissioned in 1996. Uh, later on, he served in various units. He was activated for OEF. And, you know, I was when I read your bio, Matt, uh, you were deployed to Fallujah there in 2006. Uh, I think we probably crossed paths right there because I was with the uh, uh, MEF G3. I was a deputy G3 at that time. So we probably saw each other and didn't even realize we were there together. That's right. Um, uh, you were the defense attache uh, there with the DIA. Uh, then you were force, force a recon company. Uh, you have founded the USMC IMA debt with the Defense Innovation Unit. Uh, and what, what I, I like is in your civilian career is you're also the chairman and CEO and founder of Inline Energy, uh, a clean and renewable energy developer. Uh, that's fantastic. And so welcome. And Sergeant Major, um, you are a recon man. That's all I can say. Uh, began your recon, or actually began your uh, Marine Corps career in 1996, then uh, <clears throat> served with Marine Wing Support Squadron 473, uh, then you began your, began your recon career there in January of 02 with 4th Force Recon, you're activated in June of 2005 with uh, OIF, and again in August of 2007 with uh, OIF. Uh, and then actually went and went to OEF. So, and then in uh, May of 2018, you were promoted to Sergeant Major, uh, signed the Fourth Force Recon Company. Then you went to Third Force Recon. And in 2022, June of this year, you were assigned to help stand up to MIU. So, welcome to both of you uh, from the uh, Marine Corps Reserve Association. Thanks for having us, Ken. I mean, we've uh, we know how much the Reserve Association does for Marine Forces Reserve and the Marine Corps writ large. I think it largely goes unsung all the work that you do behind the scenes. And my eyes were open thanks to Lieutenant General Bellin late last year, uh, along with others, about the contributions you make. So from us to you, thank you very much. Um, right. I'll add on one other thing on Sergeant Major. Uh, he actually, in his civilian career, has uh, an extensive IT background uh, to the point now that he's actually at one of the premier uh, AI companies working in construction services on the West Coast. So that that dual purpose Marine, you'll see you're here in the theme of today's discussion. Uh, he epitomizes that and is exactly what we're looking for. Well, that then that explains uh, why the link there uh, with the Marine Innovation Unit. And and I'll throw this out to both of you. You know, I've read the uh, 2030, you know, force design uh, and in there, especially in the uh, reserve force design, uh, I see Marine Innovation Unit all through it. So why now? Why do we need a Marine Innovation Unit? I, I'd say I'll lead off and, you know, I'll, I'll let our major come in as he sees fit is, is that um, timing is everything. Uh, right now we're facing three really existential threats out there. The one is, is commercial technology. Um, the commercial sector is iterating on things like software, hardware, drones, hypersonics at, at its pace that frankly governments can't keep up with. 
That's one. You know, the U.S. government used to be the center of all things goodness, putting people on the moon, the internet, duct tape, MREs, all those great things that we know and love were all uh, brain children of the U.S. government. Well, it took time to do that. And over time, with the things like the silicon chip and cell phones, we started to democratize the technology. Venture capitalists jumped in. And now that there was a dollar to be made, things sped up pretty quickly. We've heard about Moore's Law, the former founder of Intel Corporation. We're seeing what used to be a two-year overturn in semiconductors as a rule. We're seeing now in the software community, less than six months. Some new iteration of software comes out every six months. And when you look at that on a global scale, our adversaries are taking note of that and they're plucking those really good technologies, those dual use technologies out for military applications. And they use someone else's money, an investor, and someone else's big brain, let's say a chief technology officer at that company to give them that capability. So that's problem one. Problem two um, is, is that we, uh, I'm gonna be hard on my service here. Uh, when you look at how sausage is made, in the capability development cycle at Quantico, super hardworking Marines down there dedicated to things like force design and giving capabilities that we need, except we have a, a 1950s antiquated process. Um, so spoiler alert, uh, Ken, I'll ask you, do you want to take a guess on how long it takes to get a thing from ideation into the hands of the Marine in our current capability development process? Uh, I would venture to say at a minimum three years. Let's, let's two and a half X that it's eight years. So wow. eight years. So let's go back to problem one. If I have a uh, software iterating, let's say every six to 18 months, something, it sheds its skin, some new capability comes out and hardware like a drone or a new autonomous vehicle, it sheds its skin every 18 to 36 months but yet it takes the Marine Corps eight years to get that capability through its entire capability development process, we have an inertial mismatch and we do not have the right capability in the hands of the Marine at the right time. So timing is really important. And I'd say the third problem that we have is that um, when it comes to some of these advanced concepts, things like artificial intelligence or cyber or robotics, autonomy, advanced energy, which uh, is near and dear to my heart. You take the average belt-fed Marine 05, 06, or E8, E9, they don't get taught this stuff in the regular Marine Corps. Uh, a couple may go to a fellowship somewhere at DARPA or MIT, but for the most part, they can't keep up with these topics. So a long-winded way of answering your question, that's why MIU is here to respond to those three questions. And if I had to give in a nutshell what we do, um, we take the unique skill sets of a reservist that is uh, in their civilian or academic career uniquely qualified to be a subject matter expert in those low density skill sets that I just mentioned and apply them directly to the active component, skipping all of the, all of the bureaucracy. And we are a supporting element to the active component to help them get over uh, force design and talent management issues. So my tweet would be, if you remember those commercials, BASF, we don't make it, we make it better, faster, cheaper. That's what we do. We are the inject to accelerate force design and talent management goals for the Commandant. I think Colonel Swindle said it expertly, but you know, in addition to that, the, the Marine Corps has been improvising, adapting, and overcoming for over 246 years. The Marine Innovation Unit is really just another chapter in that long history of innovation uh, with just a different name. Uh, when I graduated, and I'll, I'll date myself, 1979, went to TBS, completed TBS, was going the aviation route. Uh, I had to wait 13, 14 months. Uh, so they sent me to headquarters Marine Corps, to the old headquarters Marine Corps on the hill. Uh, I was one of the few Marines at that time that I, I actually had a minor in computer science. So it wasn't C4I, it was C2I. Okay, so my job as a second lieutenant for the first 10 months that I went to more computer conferences than I can imagine. But 
before the colonel would release me uh, in a standard Marine Corps room, okay, uh, I had from damn near floor to ceiling, and I had to do a flow diagram uh, that charted how the Marine Corps was going to transition from its current processing to computers across all of the bases in the Marine Corps across the world. Uh, it ended up taking, it was probably seven foot, eight foot high, and probably 12 to 15 foot long that showed how we were going to introduce that. So uh, I, I understand what you're going through on that because it, it took a minute for me to get that, to get that introduced. <laughs> Well, the, uh, the good news is I was at Camp Pendleton and I opened up that that server and I saw your initials scribbled in it and it's still there. Um, I, yeah. I jest, but uh, the Marine Corps being, let's call it underfunded or um, continually not having enough resources to get after everything they want. Um, some of those legacy databases and old, old technology is still in use today. And oh. we have to make a you know, a giant quantum leap forward and moving all of that data up to a cloud-based environment so we can actually do something with it, make sense of it. And the, the issues that you're dealing with, um, it's funny, you C2I, it's now C5 ISRT. So they just keep adding numbers and letters to it to make it sound better. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're still at that, another major inflection point based on how technology and capabilities are, are driving us in that, that direction. Well, well, how about, let's take the listeners to the beginning. I mean, you know, the commandant, you know, the commander of Marine Forces Reserve didn't just wake up yesterday and said, hey, let's create a Marine Innovation Unit. Can you take the listeners back to the beginning on how your unit came to be? Sure. I mean, well, taking a page out of Sergeant Major's book, you know, this this is yet that that other chapter of, of 246 years. Um, commandant Berger really kicked into ideation with force design. Uh, the interesting thing, if you look at force design and in the initial updates, there was no mention of Marine Corps Reserve. And we were not officially tasked as a component to, to help with force design in their campaign of learning. Um, fast forward to 2021, Lieutenant General David Bellin, the commander of Marine Forces Reserve, he leans into the problem and he's looking at that he's got a unique opportunity to help the commandant and uh, the capability development cycle accelerate their issues using reservists. Um, that came at the convergence of a force design update that came at the convergence of the Marine Forces Reserve campaign plan, which I would encourage your extremely well-written uh, book, and I would encourage your listeners to read. Um, there's a, a line of operation just broadly said innovation. And at around that same time, um, I was coming off a tour with the Defense Innovation Unit and wrote a white paper called Unit 1775. Well, 1775 means something to everyone, but it basically got after what I said in the preamble. We've got these problems, we've got reservists, let's match them together. That was the impetus for the Marine Innovation Unit. And that white paper was submitted on a Tuesday. I got a call from General Bellin's aide on a Wednesday and he said, uh, you're going to meet me in the Pentagon on Thursday. There was no ask of where I was in the world, what I was doing. You know, you know, it was you're going to be there. And that's just to show you the urgency of, of, of what we need to do. And that was around July 1st, 2021. That was the start of the Marine Innovation Unit. Um, one of the first people I picked up the phone and called was Sergeant Major Lusk. And our connective bond goes back to... Fourth Force rec Reconnaissance when it was Gunnery Sergeant Lusk and Major Swindle when we started kicking around ideas uh, along with another now Colonel Dave Winokur, our Chief of Staff, of how could, we, how could we do this better from a Marine Corps perspective, being lowly field grade officers and, and staff and COs. And here we are uh, almost 10 years later now trying to make real change for the Marine Corps. Wow. Can, so can we go online and find Unit 1775 anywhere? Or is that sort of close held? Oh, no, not close held. Happy to send it to you so you can post and see. A uh, little outdated, but uh, that, that was the, uh, the seed corn for what is essentially the Marine Innovation Unit. 
and then Lieutenant General Bellin, who has a phenomenal passion for Marines and and you know the reserve opportunities and Marines that are out there, saw an opportunity to leverage the talents of those individuals that have a passion and serve in the reserves. How can they bring their experiences and their technical skill sets they use on the civilian side and bring it forward so that the Marine Corps can use that and leverage the, those talents to better push forward innovation across all components and not just the service but re, and the Department of Defense, but really the joint forces as a whole. And that's where uh, Lieutenant General Bellin really took this and drove it forward and has been the Marine Innovation Unit's champion to help push this to fruition to where we are now. Well, let me ask you, Sergeant Major, on this, uh, a little offshoot of this, but is the Innovation Unit, <clears throat> excuse me, only looking at IT-related items, or are you looking at equipment? We're uh -huh. looking at all, at all sorts of things, and just as the you know, the operational environment that we're working in is going to change. What we're looking for is going to change, but what's not going to change the type of people that we're looking for. We're looking for individuals that are motivated, that have an irrational call to service and a desire to make a difference. Uh, all too often, you have individuals that have left active service because they lost a purpose. And with the stand up and the establishment of the Marine Innovation Unit, we've been able to help them refocus that purpose and give them an opportunity to make a tangible impact and affect change, not just at a local level, but at a national and a geopolitical level across the world. I, it was, it was uh, just this morning, I was looking you know, all of us get our various sources of news uh, every morning that you look at on your smart device. And the latest one I saw was the one, um, is this it? No, it was a new type of uh, exped, what they call it, an expeditious uh, landing ship. Uh, it was going to look more like a regular cargo ship, 200 to 400 feet long. It was going to have the ability to carry up to 75 Marines per ship. Uh, and from reading the article, it was more so it would blend in better, especially in the Pacific region. <clears throat> it would make it much, much more difficult for uh, adversaries uh, to tell the difference, I mean, you can tell an aircraft carrier, that's that's easy, but okay, is that a civilian ship or is that a military ship? So uh, I, I found that one fascinating already, and, and that was just this morning. So we, I think we have a pretty good case study. Um, so along those same lines, you know, in, let's say, a contested area, let's use the South China Sea, for example, within the first or second island chain, one of the challenges is, well, how do you move Marines around expeditiously? in an area that you're gonna get sensed and shot at pretty quickly. Um, one area that, that the Marine Forces Reserve pressed into is called small craft. So these are maybe squad level, fire team level uh, craft. We you probably knew them as the, uh, the ribs back in the day, uh, the riverine craft. Well, when you look out across the landscape, there's different requirements for each of the Marine Expeditionary Forces. Some needs, some that go open water, some need, some to go riverine. There was an opportunity for General Bellin to use some congressional funding to get after the small craft and put marine reservists, as well as an opportunity to accelerate experimentation for the force. And what was a going to be probably a two plus year process actually got moved down to two and a half months. Wow. So leveraging commercial vendors. So the commercial vendors had these exquisite uh, uh, boats we used an alternative acquisition path through the Defense Innovation Unit. And what the Marine Corps could get, it's still TBD, is an asset that they can deploy and experiment with uh, that could be used within the first island chain to move those Marines around expeditiously. And I think that's a value that MIU has provided to date. What I'll do is I'll send it to uh, Devin. Uh, we just conducted our first in five years, uh, essay contest. It was the MFR MCRA essay contest. Uh, and the question posed was uh, with, you know, force design out there on the table, what should the 
Marine Corps Reserve look like? Uh, what additional skill sets? And I have to admit, there were some uh, there were some interesting papers that I will send to Devin to let you guys take a, a, a gander at, uh, especially our top three uh, recipients. Uh, you, I, I think you guys would find these uh, very very interesting. And and we we had submissions from uh, you know sergeants all the way up to full birds. Uh, that wrote papers. So I th I'll, I'll send it to the lieutenant once we're done here. I'd be curious to read those. And I think it maybe it's a segue into talent management. So if I had to say what the Marine Innovation Unit does and in, in our key piece or secret sauce is, is it of finding those Marines that have those unique dual purpose skill sets. One, they're exceptional, passionate Marine reservists. Two, they have civilian and academic skill sets that come in back into the Marine Corps, we give them an opportunity to serve um, and apply them to the problems. It, you know, it sounds fairly simple, yet it's pretty complex. And I think Sergeant Major has some uh, some data points of like who we're looking for and how you serve to get after what General Bellin says is the irrational call to service of which every Marine Reservist is highly irrational for doing what we do. <laughs> but well, um, that was going to be actually how I was going to lead into it. You know, because I was. I was active duty for a while. I did a standard SMCR. Uh, I was an IMA. Uh, so Sergeant Major, from implement, you know, from concept to implementation, uh, how did you? How did the unit acquire the Manning, uh, and and where did that Manning come from? Well, one of the things that often uh, individuals don't understand is, or, or at least haven't comprehended, is that Lieutenant General Bellin has almost 100,000 Marines underneath him, if you count those in the inactive ready reserve and on the uh, uh, inactive standby list. Now, most of those are inactive and they're out. And again, they left active service for one reason or another. And we wanted to leverage you know, different technologies and different approaches, some of the leading solutions that the civilian world ut utilizes to be able to recognize that talent and bring them into the fold. One of the ways we were able to do that is we, we had email, uh, various emails that went out to the various groups um, and various marketing campaigns to go, hey, we're here, we have opportunities. Are you interested based off your skill set? In the first week, we had over 300 applicants apply. In the first five months, we had over 1,100 applicants apply. And when we say apply, this isn't like how the Marine Corps normally goes and says, and is pushed to individuals, because we don't want individuals to just f find us. We want to find them. In order to do that, we reached out, we have them provide their information. It's not just a master brief sheet, and it's not um, just a reserve qualification summary. We want them to, uh, to provide us their civilian resume. Uh, in some occasions, write an essay. Why do you want to be here? How can you, how can you help? And the purpose is to bring them in and help them help individuals make a difference and impact in what we do. So we would vet them, we would bring them in, and then um, once selected, we would uh, be able to start moving forward. And we've been doing that for about the last six months. I'll even I've been seeing Sergeant Major's praises even more. You know, the the average we we call it the inner unit transfer process. So there's two people people that are in and actively working as reservists, and then you have people that are technically out. Uh, they still earn the title Marine, but they don't drill anymore. They're in that individual ready, res inactive ready reserve, inactive standby list. They've, they've walked to the light and they're almost gone. And to date, about 30% of our unit are those Marines that have walked out of the Marine Corps. They turned right abound and walked right back in and said, I'm ready to put the, the suit back on. Uh, we have a Sergeant uh, who did two tours as a 0311 infantryman um, got out in 2000, what was it? 2012. And then being an exceptional Marine got accepted to Stanford university, got a degree from Stanford, went on to co-found one of the most successful, uh, defense consulting firms in the world, um, worth over a hundred million dollars today. Um, he, after nine years of being separated threw his hand in the air, contacted Sergeant major and says, I want to be part of this unit. And that's the type of talent that we're, we're bringing in. But the inner unit transfer process, thanks to Sergeant Major and others at MIU, is down to about seven days if you're in the Select Marine Corps Reserve or the individual mobilization augmentee. 
a um, little bit longer if you're in the inactive ready reserve. And I think we got our work cut out for us for those that are on the standby list. Uh, we, we're currently at nine months. We need to do better uh, to afford an opportunity for those Marines to come back in. You know, that said, there are, while there are challenges still to overcome, there's there's definitely successes that we need to celebrate. For example, on, on the, that outstanding sergeant that uh, Colonel Swindle mentioned, who'd been out of the Marine Corps for nine years, we were able to bring him back into the fold into a selected Marine Corps reserve status in approximately nine months. And while we need to streamline that more, that is a rare feat, and we're going to continue to push that to, to find Marines that have a desire to serve and have the experience to serve and can make a difference and we can bring them back into the Marine Corps so they can make an active contribution to Force Design 2030 and the National Defense Strategy. Hey, Sergeant Major, how many are we up to right now? What's our head count for fiscal year 22? Fiscal year 22, we're sitting at well over 125 Marines, which met our initial operating uh, uh, capability objective. By the end of FY23, we're going to be sitting at approximately 270, and we'd like to cap this out by the end of FY24 with about 350. So, you know, 0.03% of the total population is all that we're compensated to hire. But Internally, we kind of go back and forth. How many of these exceptional Marines with these dual use skill sets do we have? I think three to 5,000. I think it's three to 5% of the total reserve force. Um, so it's pretty competitive. But one thing we need to do better as a institution is uh, not, you know, the recon push, recon pull. We need a better job of understanding what are the talents of these Marines beyond what their MOS and rank is. Um, and I think this is the first foray into how we can get after this a little bit better as an example for, let's say, the, the Assistant Commandant's Talent Management X initiative uh, to better align people's skills to billets in the future. And, and to caveat off what Colonel Swindle was mentioning is, you know, the Marine Innovation Unit is made up of all facets and all components of the Marine Corps. We have we represent active component Marines, active reserve component Marines and selected Marine Corps reserve Marines. Uh, and we wanna bring them into the fold and make sure that we have, that again, every everyone has an opportunity to contribute. You know, In addition, uh, we have some opportunities for uh, selected Marine Corps reserve Marines to move and support a two to three year uh, active reserve tour where they get permanent change of station um, benefits on the front and back end, and they they have the opportunity to serve in uh, some phenomenal you know institutions you know, regarding science and technology, the Marine Corps Warfighting Lab, uh, Marine Forces Cyber, Marine Installations Command, and and many more. And those are for both officer and enlisted. Um, we are not just an officer centric organization. At least 25% of our Marines right now are enlisted. And good ideas and perspective come from all over the place. And the sergeant that we mentioned before is, is just one example. And from Lance Corporal to Colonel, regardless of the military occupational specialty, if you have the experience, you are welcome here at the Marine Innovation Unit. For, for those that are just joining us, we're here today with the Marine Innovation Unit Command Team, uh, Colonel Matt Swindell and Sergeant Major Robert Lusk. Uh, gentlemen, again, thanks for being here. Uh, I. I know where you're coming from on the quick joins. I was a, I was drilling for points at old Naval Air Station, Dallas, Texas. And I did Desert Shield, Desert Storm, uh, oh. fell into the IRR, uh, was there about four months and said, you know, I, I, I miss it. So I went and got a fresh haircut, put my uniform on, walked into MAG-41, and the first person I ran into was the MAG OPSO, had, had my record book. Hey, can I join? Just want to drill for points. Um, and I started out as the MAG ground safety officer. And within about four months, five months, uh, I was, again, drilling for points, was the assistant OPSO for the air group. And the CO... Now, I was in there probably two months, three months, and the CEO of the MAG uh, walked in on a Thursday, and he threw his hands on my desk, and he said, how would you like to get back into the SMCR and start flying again? And I said, well, let me think about it, sir. Yes. And Monday afternoon, I was back in the SMCR roles. 
Now, I don't know how they did it in three days and over a weekend, but it can be done. So it's just a matter of pushing those right buttons and clicking those uh, those switches. Well, generally, uh, pilots are better funded and smarter than any other Marine. You know, I, I'd say maybe that's probably how it happened. Well, I don't know if I'd say all that. We some pretty smart individuals out there. Uh, let me ask you this then. So can you tell us, can you tell the listeners what the actual mission statement of the Innovation Unit is? Uh, yeah, we, we have, we're taking reservists with exquisite skill sets and applying them to the most pressing problems for force design, talent management, the Naval Service, and the Joint Force. Uh, we, if it doesn't tie to those four things, we're not going to do it. Uh, in the guiding documents as we led on are, you know, force design 2030, talent management 2030, and the Marine Forces Reserve campaign plan. If we can't tie it back to that, we're not going to do it. So in that, in that instance, we have a sniper rifle approach. Um, how we go about that is, is that's also a little bit of the special sauce. So it goes back to you reaffiliating. I think the one thing that we do a little bit differently is we're, we're coining the reserve unit of the future. So as we talk to these Marines, the Sergeant Major and I, we're like, okay, why do you want to come to the reserve uh, unit like this? And the, the preponderance of the, of the answers, the common denominator of all Marines is I want to make a difference. I want to feel that my contributions are, are good. And let me give you an example. We have a, a Marine Major she is an aviation supply officer that has an intense desire to serve, be with her tribe, the Marines, um, combat veteran. And she has decided to get off active duty. She went to MIT where she got a PhD in data science. She started a family and then went on to be a founder of uh, a leading uh, artificial intelligence company. Right? So now there's a competition for her civilian career as a startup founder, her family desires, and he has this irrational call to service to continue to be a Marine. She's got three balls in the air. One of them's going to fall. So under the old structure, um, she would have to go in, let's say, get on a plane and travel down to Fort Worth to a, a VMGR unit that has a Marine Aviation Logistics Squadron next to it. And she would lead Marines, which is a vitally needed skill. But I ask, I ask myself, and other people ask themselves, where is that Marine skill set better served? Is it as the Marine major reservist, at, as the maintenance officer for an aviation logistics squadron? The answer is yes. But is it also tapping into her civilian skill set as a subject matter expert, in this case, supply chain, as it relates to artificial intelligence? And what MIU tries to do is tap into that latter half. And the deal that we've struck is, is that we think the most valuable thing that we can give you back as a Marines to meet you in the middle is your time. Your time is your most valuable commodity and we respect that. So in many cases, the Marines uh, drill remotely. If COVID taught us anything, you can still get work done virtually. And then when the problem arises that we need to help to solve, the active component engages us and we form little mini MAGTAFs, Marine Air Ground Task Force of we take a little bit of AI, a little bit of consulting, a little bit of people who have inside knowledge on the defense group that maybe worked at the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center. We include them together, they get on a plane, and they fly to our customer. And then they help consult, solve problems, uh, look up and out to the joint force in the commercial sector. And when they're done with that project, or we call them engagements, they disaggregate, they go back home, and they continue to work on things as they go forward. What we found out of the gate, this has been a successful model. Um, the active component values it, the reservist values it. And what we're seeing is retaining talent because it gets back to what I, I led in with. The Marine feels like they're making impact on the greater Marine Corps. Wow. Uh, everything you just <clears throat> stated there leads to a couple of questions. Uh, one, where is the headquarters? of the unit uh, located now? We are in Newburgh, New York. So uh, when I was told that our headquarters is gonna be in Newburgh, I had to break open the map and actually look it up because it's not something that just rolls off the tongue or top of mind. 
Uh, Newburg is is smack dab in the middle of the Hudson River Valley. Um, probably next to West Point. It's just 20 minutes north of West Point, uh, the, the United States Military Academy. Uh, really rich history in the area. Uh, and at first, eh, I will say I was a little poo-pooish on going there. It wasn't what you consider a hub of innovation like Silicon Valley or Boston or Austin or some of uh, Research Triangle Park or Seattle for artificial intelligence. But over the past year and having the opportunity to spend a lot of time in New York, it's actually an ideal location for a couple of reasons. One, just let's do train appreciation. If you look at the Syracuse Albany connector all the way down to New York City, the only thing that sits in the middle is West Point and now the Marine Innovation Unit. So we act as connective file, uh, literally, between the two areas uh, to, to uh, connect some really active, both technology at the government, academic, and I think about an eighth of the world GDP flows through New York City with all the venture money that goes down there and the startups as well. So that's one. Um, the second part is, is that there is no other service level command at any form or fashion within the state of New York. So we have 2,500 startups in New York City. Well, who's mining those to see who has dual use technologies? Who's at, let's say, the Air Force Research Lab in Rome, New York? Who's going to Rensselaer Polytechnic um, and all these other areas? Who's sitting side by side with the New York Air National Guard? and working out how can we get after a lot of these force design issues together. And I think we're centrally located there um, at the headquarters of a uh, former C-130 squadron and an aviation logistics. So beautiful base. Um, it's perfect for what we need to do. Um, and we already have our active duty um, partners already set up there to help us do what we need to do. Sorry, Major, did I miss anything? Oh, that about covers it. And while we do have a central location where we're headquartered, because we're a selected Marine Corps Reserve unit, how we drill is a little different. With, with most selected Marine Corps Reserve units, you'll have a central location on a monthly basis where everyone comes to. But due to the nature, depth, and, and breadth of our mission set and the problem sets we're, uh, we're looking to solve, we have to be flexible. So we really have more of a non-standard drill schedule. We get together as a unit at least twice a year, but the remainder of the year, Marines are assigned to individual engagements, just like <clears throat> Colonel Swindle said, um, based off of their specific skill sets and the needs for that problem set we're trying to solve. These engagements can be um, supported in a disaggregated uh, or collaborative approach, uh, or they might require travel to facilitate the desired outcome. Um, but as the Marines do that, and the reason that we have to have that flexible drill schedule is because sometimes the greatest value that we can provide is not a specific recommendation to a solution, but instead it's based off our, our ability to provide a different perspective. And, and sometimes the greatest wins we've been able to come up with, really it's not our ability to solve a problem, but as Colonel Swindle mentioned, it's our ability to establish a connection with other organizations that can support and help drive forward that problem set for the end user that we're trying to help achieve that, uh, that objective. And that was, I originally thought you guys were going to be an IMA unit, but the Lieutenant squared me away before we got on this, on this talk this morning that you're now an SMCR unit. We are, I mean, there are, there are definitely some benefits to both the individual augmentee as well as the selected Marine Corps reserve and just Due to the integrated nature of the active component, the active reserve, and the selected Marine Corps Reserve uh, component Marines, the, um, the force decided that that would be the best way for us to be able to, in a flexible and disaggregated manner, uh, approach and attack these problem sets presented to us to uh, uh, try to support. Well, how long can a Marine uh, serve within the unit? That is an excellent question. The, the Marine Innovation Unit is not a place where Marines go to die. <laughs> Marines go to sit there the whole career. This is, I like to think of it as a joint type billet because throughout the Marine Corps, we, we preach at all levels, whether all the way up through the general officer level or all the, way, all the way down on the enlisted side of the value of perspective, the value of being able to work in a joint environment and work across and outside, not only your, your unit, but your service. And that's one of the, um, 
one of the benefits that the Marine Innovation Unit can provide is the ability and perspective to look at joint support. So Marines will come in here, Marines will work here for two to three years, and then Marines will rotate back into their active or reserve component roles and take with them that knowledge and that expertise they learned to help continue to facilitate change at the lowest level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to make that comment that, you know, someone comes there for three years, uh, learns all this, this, you know, new skill set, look at the ripple effect once, you know, in three years, once your first group of Marines, your plank owners, start rotating back to other units, uh, I mean, everything from administration, logistics, you know, IT, uh, at all levels of command, uh, how they can enhance those units all across the Marine Corps and Marine Corps Reserve. And that's our job. That we, we need to create a revolving door. We need to create opportunities where they get some of this uh, training that is non-doctrinal. So we're right now, we just came off of uh, our annual training for what we're calling cohort one, the initial hundred Marines that came in. And we, we essentially did what's called a innovation 1000 series over the course of a week. So teaching them about the threat, we're teaching them about how things are done in the Marine Corps from capability development, the acquisition cycle, um, requirements writing, these are things that you don't typically sit down and you're getting as an MOS producing school. These are things that you get experientially from your career, which normally takes 15 to 25 years to understand. We, we put all that into uh, you know, 10 days, uh, excuse me, eight days of classes, and we're ready to um, give them a, a level set on how they can get into the heads of their active duty component and also sit side by side and understand their struggles. That is the most important part is understanding where our active component is coming from so that we can provide value to them in the form of consultancy, subject matter experts, or like Sergeant Major said, hey, there's someone else that's already doing this. They're way ahead of us. So why don't we just be the remorade of the shark and tag onto what they're due? They're going to fully fund this and chop three years off the timeline. That's a win for the Marine Corps in a resource constrained, time constrained environment that we're in right now. And one of the benefits the, the Marine Corps gets out of this, I'll look at it from an enlisted perspective, is all too often, you know, throughout the Marine Corps, we tout the benefits of B billets, of billets outside of the MOS to help provide perspective so that when Marines come back into their MOS, they're more well-rounded Marines and better able to support the commanders and the force. And I see the Marine Innovation Unit as just another type of B billet to, again, give that Marine a different perspective to allow them to better support the total force. So right now, as you stated at the end of FY22, you got 125 Marines. Uh, how many, I guess, uh, different projects are you working on at any one time? Uh, we we were in stealth mode uh, to use commercial uh, technology uh, startup uh, coin phrase. Uh, we had about eight. So if you've read Steve Blank, he's a Stanford University professor. He wrote a book, uh, The Lean Startup. Uh, there's a whole bunch of out there, but the old model would, would have been, um, Sergeant Major and I have a great idea. We go ahead and write a, a massive business plan. We go to the venture, uh, the people that are going to finance our business. We convince them via come hook or crook that this is a great idea. They give us this big bag of money. And then we take that idea and we go shop it to customers. And in some cases, the customers come back and said, we're not interested and your business falls flat. What uh, Steve Blank said is like, no, don't go raise any capital, write down a straw man, go out and test it with your customers and said, is this what you want? No, go back to the drawing board. Well, is this what you want? Yeah, that's getting pretty close. Okay, one more iteration. Is this what you want? That's perfect. Uh, I'll sign up for a pilot study. Then you go back, maybe you get paid money and then you go back and you get funding, but on better terms because you proved the concept with paying customers. We took that same concept for the last year at MIU. We leaned in to about eight engagements um, with the active duty to stress test how we could use reserve talent in support of their goals. And so far, um, it looks pretty interesting. The feedback's really good. We've worked on uh, true consultancy model. We've worked on classified missions. We've worked on the small craft issue and the feedback we're getting is very positive. Now we're at an inflection point. 
um, we are out of stealth mode, we need now to scale that. So I anticipate that we're probably going to be upwards of 30 discrete engagements for fiscal year 23. And as we grow up to 270 Marines this year, um, they're going to be fully engaged with the active component. And an engagement could be a couple day meeting. It could be several months of which we have reservists rotating in and out to support uh, whatever activity they need done on the active component. So I think it's a, it's an evolving uh, model and mission, but so far the feedback has been very positive. And, and I was, that, that was exactly what I was going to ask is, so at the end of 23, you're looking at 270 Marines. So that's going to allow you to increase your engagement uh, across the active duty and the reserves. But that leads to a, a question, a two part question. First one is, what is your chain of command? And then second question is, how do you get your tasking? Um, I'll take the chain of command and, and I'll, I'll defer the tasking to Sergeant Major, but uh, you can have uh, only one boss, but I have many masters. So my boss is uh, <laughs> Lieutenant General Bellin, the commander of Marine Forces Reserve. He has been our, our uh, champion through this whole thing. And I'm a direct report to him, which is, as you know, Ken, extremely atypical. There's four major subordinate commands at Marine Forces Reserve. So the MAW, the Marine Aircraft Wing, the Division, the Force Headquarters Group, and Marine Logistics Group. And then there's this little straggler called the Marine Innovation Unit, the fifth one kind of hanging out there. And what he did is he didn't want any bureaucracy um, to slow us down. So I directly report to him. Now to the many masters. Uh, we directly support... Um, combat development and integration. So uh, that, that whole institution working very closely with combat development directorate, CDD, and the Marine Corps Warfighting Lab. So this would be Brigadier General Lightfoot, this on CDD, this would be Brigadier General Ellison at the Marine Corps Warfighting Lab. Those are kind of the hub and spoke of, of the combat development process. And we have a significant amount of our staffing focused on those efforts. Now we also do work for Mar4 Cyber, we're about to engage installations and logistics. Um, we have the Marine Coders, um, which is supporting a number of areas. These are Marines that are doing real-time coding to support Marine Corps software um, initiatives. So it's a pretty uh, broad scope. So let me hand it off to Sergeant Major. Absolutely. You know, our engagements, as we call them, or the opportunities for those engagements can come in via multiple means. And the first thing that we take a look at when an engagement opportunity comes in is, does it tie directly to force design? If it doesn't tie directly to force design, because we have a finite amount of resources, um, then we have to really deprioritize it. Um, the next we take a look at is, can it be completed in a timely manner? You know, current, we, we don't want to engage in something that's going to take, you know, three to five years to be able to implement. We really want to get something that we can help identify a solution for um, in, you know, this first, you know, in less than a year, ideally, obviously there's flexibility depending on the specific project or, or problem set we're looking at. Um, and those are really some of, some of the major factors that we take a look at. And then we board the engagements, we see if it meets all those, and then we prioritize them based off of, you know, who their champion is. And, and that's one of the things that we have to have. We here at the Marine Innovation Unit do not have the manpower or resources to run programs. That's not what we're here to do. We're here to help provide solutions, help streamline solutions, help identify ways to reduce costs and then hand it off. And we, with all of these engagements, we have to have a model where, where does the engagement start? Where does the engagement end? Where is the value add? And most importantly, is there an executive champion at a certain level that is going to fund this and is going to take this to fruition and push forward whatever it is that we provide. So that's some of the uh, processes that we utilize to decide how and what engagements we're going to take. So the, the big picture, Ken, is to go back to where we started. They, they, remember I asked you how long it takes to develop a capability? We need to get it down to three years. So our goal, our metric for success, and probably Sergeant Major and my uh, successors are going to have to take this on. We have to get the Marine Corps into the three-year shot group to use known distance range. If we do that, we keep pace with not only the congressional funding cycle of a POM cycle, but we also keep pace with technology overturn. 
Are we going to be able to do that for everything? Probably not. You know, if it shoots, if it floats, if it flies, it's probably going to have to go through that traditional development cycle of eight years because that's the big money that Congress gives to Congress, whether it's flowing through the Navy to the Marine Corps. I would opine that a vast preponderance of what we need on the future battlefield is available today through either the commercial sector or the other services or our allied uh, host and partner nations. They already have the skill sets. We just need to tap into it. Well, being as young as the unit is, uh, you obviously haven't run into the issue of, well, General X wants this looked at and General Y wants that looked at and competing priorities. You haven't you haven't had that problem set yet then? Have you? No, everyone we've engaged at the senior level, uh, whether it's general officer, senior executive service, um, uh, colonel, programmatic managers, they've been very receptive to uh, what we can offer them. And what we ask, ask in exchange is just get us on target. Tell us, give us the context that you live and breathe every day so that we can get smart, understand the problem that you're dealing with right now so we can run off and figure out a better way could be a process improvement. It could be in some cases just picking up the phone and connecting, you know, Colonel X to Colonel Y because they haven't talked before. Um, I know that sounds uh, pretty, pretty sophomoric, but that's when you're, you're getting crushed every day uh, down in the Davis building in Quantico and you can't pick your head up to see the forest of the trees. That might be the one thing you needed to get your project one incremental step further along the capability development cycle. And I think that's a benefit we have. We are the up and out to the Marine Corps active component down and in to help them move things through their sausage grinder a little bit quicker. Well, you're really going to enjoy the, uh, the first, second, and third place finishers in the essay contest uh, in no certain order. One was a process improvement in administration. Um, who was the, that paper was submitted by an INI uh, out on the West Coast, uh, and the you know the bluff of it is is that the last time Marine Corps Reserve mobilized a battalion to backfill an active duty battalion for deployment, uh, they damn near failed because they couldn't get all their admin together. Right, so I think you're going to totally enjoy reading that paper because she gives some very, here's, here's what I recommend that the Marine Corps Reserve does. Uh, so I know you will, you'll find that interesting. Uh, another paper uh, pertained to the jointness branch uh, for the, that the Marine Corps Reserve uh, could provide. And then the last one was on utilizing uh, instead of a squad or typical O3 uh, platoon going out. Mm -hmm. Well, think of a, a Marine O3 platoon uh, combined with the Rat Patrol. Okay, so now you have these lightweight vehicles and you put these lightweight vehicles uh, with an O3 and now you've given them the mobility. Um, so your unit will find these papers very, very interesting because uh, it's right up your alley. And I think, you know, some people have said, well, MIU is going to be, you know, the hub of all great things. You're going to be these chin scratching, prolific thinkers they are going to solve. No, in some cases, all we're doing is elevating a voice that's already out there. And let's take your mobility piece uh, using, uh, let's say something like an M razor, an electric all-terrain vehicle and putting Marines in it with the right capabilities. And they're out there and they're saying, wow, if it only did this, and if MIU could channel that into the right people at the, that can make a decision on that, that's a win. You get that Lance Corporal's voice up-leveled into the ear of the colonel that's coming up with the next generation capability. And to go to your first comment, I don't know if uh, Lieutenant uh, Devin teed you up for this. Administration is my Achilles heel. And it has been for my entire reserve career. I don't know how Marines continue to serve uh, in that. This is just my editorial. Um, I, I've heard from plenty of Marines. It's like, sir, I'm getting out. Why are you getting out? I, I want to be a Marine. I don't want to sit here and fill out paperwork all day long and then have it kick back to me. My travel claim kicked back to me six, seven, eight times. You know what, sir? I haven't gotten paid 
because it's just, it's too much pain for me to, my time goes back to my time is valuable. So what Sergeant Major and I have challenged the unit is um, what we call line of operation zero is create a streamlined administrative and operational unit that can be used as a template for every other Marine Corps unit to get after this problem of we got to do better. We have to value the Marines time. And guess what? It's in the Marine Corps control to the far extent to create those efficiencies on the admin side. I don't know. Sergeant Major, do you have any examples of things that have just been, you know, daggers in our eyeballs uh, in the last year? Well, the, the reserve component faces challenges with administration and, and, and resources as it is. And it goes back to the, you know, we have to adapt and overcome and, you know, challenges that are inefficient uh, yet or processes that are inefficient, but there may not be a better solution. And, and we're trying to take a look at the perspective on how we do this. For example, when it comes to our ability to uh, teledrill, telework, to, to the ability to utilize, um, not just from an administration standpoint, but from a tech, uh, technical standpoint, how do, we how do we utilize approved, you know, DOD and Marine Corps solutions to continue that collaborative approach? Um, because the more collaborative we are and the more interconnecting tissue that we have with already approved solutions, the more effective we can be in supporting the administrative, administrative tasks that we have, whether it's utilizing solutions through uh, you know, Marine Online, whether it's utilizing approved, um, you know, text text messaging solutions by the DOD, it's important to look at what the civilian world does. But not everything that the civilian world does pertains directly to the Department of Defense. It's not necessarily practical. So, looking at optimizing the opportunities and the technology stack that we have within already within DOD is one of our efforts. And that is directly driving our ability to help streamline some of the, um, the administrative process challenges that we have. Well, I, I cannot echo that more. When I was CO uh, of my unit there at Fort Worth, the, the smartest thing I did was I got my CWO4 promoted to CWO5 uh, admin officer. And I know a lot of people, you know, just about every command think, you know, the OPSO is the most important than logistics. Um, but I always thought it was the admin officer who was um, like you've given the examples already. Um, so the very first meeting that first week as CO, I pulled me and the admin officer sat down uh, and we talked, okay, what do you need to be successful? And how can I help you get those things? So sitting down with her, we developed the list, priority list, and it paid off because 9-11 occurred. Um, and we got the word, uh, let's see, probably two months later that I, when we went into Afghanistan, and I think they went in in January, February of the next year, um, it, a lot of people think it was active duty 130s, Marine 130s that went in, but it wasn't. It was uh, reserves. I provided a uh, five aircraft debt, and those guys were out the door in under two months with all their, you know, everything that they needed, so no one was left behind. Uh, including the readiness program for their families. We had to make certain. So I, I hear you and I feel your pain. It's the uh, best compliment you can get from active duty, right? At the end of the deployment, they say, oh, I didn't know you were a reservist. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That's, that, that, I had that said to me. I had no idea you were a reservist. And, and that's what you want. You want it to be a seamless transition. You know, I just, and for, I'll start with you, Sergeant Major. Uh, what, uh, what are some of the uh, interesting means by which uh, the unit is advertising and getting uh, those that are almost out the door or those that have been out the door and want to come back in? How are you getting Marines and getting the word out on the unit? There's a couple different approaches that we're taking. Um, one of the approaches that we're doing, as mentioned before, is, you know, sending out emails to all those individuals, you know, very targeted emails to individuals in the 
uh, inactive status list or the inactive ready reserve. We're, you know, we're sending out information to all of the major subordinate commands within Marine Forces Reserve saying, hey, do you have individuals that work in the STEM fields, science, science and technology fields that are interested in coming over? Uh, we'll also go to some of the inactive ready reserve mega musters and take a look at that. And then we also post um, and how we solicit for Marines is, hey, how do you apply for a job here at MIU? Well, go to miu.applytojob.com, or if you have any questions, go to MIU, you know, send an email to miu at usmc.mil, and we'll get back to you. And we want individuals to apply. And sometimes individuals, when they apply, there may be a position open now, or we're interested in them, and there's nothing now, but we know we might have something in the future. So we keep those individuals that we haven't quite selected for the first round for if something comes up later on, we'll reach back out to them and we'll offer them, hey, another opportunity has come up. Are you still interested? And so, this, so those are some of the main ways that we've uh, both advertised and, and we solicit both from a push and pull standpoint to help fill our roles. And I'll even go further. We are a largely a rankless, no MOS and any status. So primarily we're looking for corporal to colonel. Everything in between, warrant officer, chief warrant officer, I don't personally care what your rank is. What I care about is, are you an exceptional Marine that's passionate about serving? And do you have one of those unique skill sets um, that's on our website that you could do? You know, things like, oh, I code on the side at night. I like to do that. Or I'm a gamer. Okay, I fly uh, unmanned uh, UAV. I, I do UAV drone racing league. Oh, I definitely want to talk to you. Because you're doing skill sets that the Marine Corps doesn't necessarily do on their on their day. And added to manufacturing, I go build stuff and 3D print stuff. We want to talk to you. So on the other skill sets, not just reservists, but there's a program called Direct Affiliate Program. These are active duty Marines that have fulfilled their obligation. They've served and they drop into um, an act, inactive status. Most Marines have some form of... Uh, contract for let's say four years, four years active, four years reserve, and they can choose whether they want to continue to serve or drop into the inactive uh, ready reserve. Um, if you have those skill sets that you might have picked up in active duty that are what I'm calling low density, we want to talk to you. Um, and I think that's a, a real opportunity for us to keep people involved with being a Marine while they pursue whatever civilian or academic career or family uh, um, objective that they have. Well, I can. What, I think the association can help you out now. Uh, what we can do is in our monthly newsletter, we can we can put a block in there for you, uh, and you know once that's published, uh, that, that'll go to a few thousand uh, Marines that can look at that, and we'll put a, a link because it's an electronic newsletter. We'll put a link to your website, uh, to the jobs website in there to help you uh, spread the word also. And I don't see an issue with us putting it on our web page also. That's another way to get it out. Uh, we, we welcome that and appreciate it. And I think people that do apply are going to look at the interface and say, hmm, this looks a lot like Indeed.com uh, or Jobs.com when I apply for a job. And there's a reason for that. It's actually a commercial platform called Jazz HR. And we leveraged a commercial recruiting software that has artificial intelligence embedded in the back end where a Marine can go in and look at the 15 or 18 open jobs and they can apply to what they think is best suited to their interests and experience. And then we match that up with what the requirements are coming in from the Marine Corps, the demand signal. So we create a supply and demand marketplace, another example of where the Marine Corps could maybe take notice. And it, it reminds them of, this is exactly how I applied to a job in the civilian sector. And that feedback has also been very positive. It also helps us as leaders to identify um, who, who is going to be a top candidate for that job because it, it is very competitive uh, for the few amount of compensated slots that we do have. And as part of that, that's why it's one of the different approaches we take as we review this is it's not just about your military record. It's about what additional, whether it's, you know, your technology background, your educational background, um, you know, what else can you bring that you didn't learn in the Marine Corps to help benefit the Marine Corps because of that irrational call to service you have. And that's why we have them bring, you know, post their civilian resume, potentially write a small essay on, you know, what's your passion? What do you want to do? What do you want to solve? How can we employ you 
with what you love to do to help address a problem set that's going to help make us make us a more secure nation. And all of those things, you know, really make a difference in the quality of candidates we get um, and the quantity. And, you know, we have job postings that go up all the time. We encourage individuals to, you know, look back on a regular basis and um, definitely welcome uh, your um, the opportunity you said to, to, to link that site. And the more we can get this out, the more opportunity we can give Marines an additional, you know, opportunity to serve. Well, super. I, I for the wrap up question, I'll start with you, Sergeant Major, and it'll be the same one for you, Matt. Um, what final words would you like to pass on to the listeners uh, that we haven't covered in any of the questions here? Just that Marines are Marines. It doesn't matter if you're an active component. It doesn't matter if you're in a reserve component. It doesn't matter if you're out. If you have a Marine or if you are a Marine and you have a passion for what you do, if you have a passion for this great country that we live in, and if you have a passion to help support the Marine Corps and you have those skill sets that we're looking for, we want you. We're going to find a way to bring you back into the fold. So come join us. Take a look at miu.applytojob.com. See if there's something you're interested in and come join us in helping make a difference. I would say I'm... Uh echo everything that the Sergeant Major just said, and it is a great time to be in the Marine Corps Reserve right now. We are at a major inflection point where the active component, absent a time of war where break glass, I need reserves to get us out to the sandboxes. The active component is calling right now. Uh, they are open for business and they are open to any good idea. And right now the Marine Corps Reserve has those good ideas. So if you wanna make a contribution and you want your contributions to be valued, we are trying to remove all of the bureaucracy so that you can get in there, be in front of the general, be in front of the sergeant major, be in front of the 06s that are making decisions on the future of the lethality of our core um, to compete and win and create unfair advantages. This is your opportunity. And I would personally like to hear from you. Well, gentlemen, I, I can't. This has been a great conversation. And thanks for being flexible there in your time. Uh, for the listeners, we've had the Marine Innovation Unit Command Team, Colonel Matt Swindell and Sergeant Major Robert Lusk with us today. Uh, and gentlemen, it, it's been an absolute privilege. And I know this podcast will help a lot of listeners better understand what the MIU is doing, uh, not only for the reserves, but active duty across DOD and uh, the defense of the United States. So I'd like to say thank you uh, for joining us today. Well, thank you, Ken. Uh, I really enjoy the opportunity to be here with you and uh, look forward to our next discussion. Semper Fi. Semper Fidelis. Thank you again for listening to today's podcast. Don't forget to rate us below and to share our podcast. If you would like to participate or if you know someone that would be of interest, please contact us at USMCRA at USMCRA.org. Since 1926, the MCRA has been supporting the Marine Corps Reserves, and as long as there is a reserve, we will be here. Semper Fidelis.